Good morning. The famous series Peanuts featuring Charlie Brown. It's one of my wife's favorite cartoons. He has a favorite oxymoronic expression. Anybody remembers what it is? When, when the brother came up that led the creed and memory verse said that if there's anything wrong with the slides, then my wife will know when she goes back. I said in my heart, good grief. <laughs> Quite in the character of Charlie Brown, this expression, good grief, is an oxymoron. Two different things, we think, that don't really fit together, but are used as a verbal cue in a heightened state of disbelief that something bad has happened. We think this is an oxymoron because we don't think grief is good. To us, good and grief don't normally come together. The Bible says there is good grief. To be more precise, the grief that is good is godly grief that produces repentance. Last week, we considered MOR, the Ministry of Reconciliation. This is repentance that is necessary for reconciliation. When two parties torn apart, torn apart by sin, by painful acts, by wrong perceptions, by things that have caused division, things that have caused hurt, there cannot be true reconciliation unless there is true repentance. Change is required. We who are sinners, we cannot be reconciled to God unless we repent. Repentance is a requirement for reconciliation. God applies the great exchange to us, 2 Corinthians 5.21. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Where God applies the change, the great exchange our sins on Jesus, his righteousness on us. With that great exchange, God reconciles us to himself. Reconciliation is not just taught. Second Corinthians illustrates the living out of this process. It is an epistle that is not just didactic by content, but didactic by purpose. Last week, we considered the context, and I told you the situation was such that Paul's relationship to the church was strained. Paul had a painful visit with them. He refers to this in chapter 2, verse 1. He had written a severe letter of tears. He refers to that in chapter 2 and in today's passage. This was a situation where some in the church of Corinth preferred super apostles, people who spoke better than Paul, people who appeared more gifted than Paul. It's not that Paul was just some prima donna who needed everybody to love him. This is not just a personal thing for Paul. The context tells us if the church at Corinth rejected Paul, they rejected the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is the reason why Paul had to explain his conduct and ministry. This is the reason why he had to defend himself, because the stakes are very high. If they went with the false apostles, the super apostles, they would reject the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's why Paul pleads with the Corinthian church in the ministry of reconciliation, be reconciled to God. If they rejected Paul, they rejected God. 
Paul, therefore, explains in the structure of his book, his conduct and ministry. In chapter 1 to 7, he explains why he does what he does, what true ministry in the new covenant looks like, how it means to see the power of God in jars of clay, how to have an eternal perspective where the righteous judge, the one who will determine all, will assess and will be the final arbiter on who is truly great. Thankfully, thankfully, he gets to chapter 7. And in chapter 7, there's a transition. In chapter, chapter 7, verse 4, he says, Great is my boldness of speech toward you. Great is my glory, my boasting of you. I'm filled with comfort. I'm exceedingly joyful in all of our tribulation. For those of you who are here for praise and thanksgiving Sunday, where we considered from chapter 1 the God of all comfort, you find the themes of chapter 1 coming back in chapter 7. And that's how we know there's a bookmark, if you like, in this section. Comfort, joy, confidence. Even in trouble, the God of all comfort had comforted the Apostle Paul. How did he comfort? God, that comforted those that are cast down, comforted us by the coming of Titus. We may ask, what's so special about the coming of Titus? And Paul explains, not by his coming only, but by the consolation wherewith he was comforted in you when he told us your earnest desire, your mourning, your fervent mind towards me, so that I rejoice the more. Titus, very likely, was the one who had brought the severe letter to the Corinthian church. He was Paul's man on the ground. Paul was looking for him. He didn't find him. His spirit was troubled, almost depressed. But here, Titus brought good news, comforting news, encouraging news. News to an apostle who was very, very concerned about the reaction of the church. He was worried sick about the, how the Corinthians should respond to this severe letter. He wanted to meet Titus at Troas. He didn't show up. He went on to Macedonia. Praise the Lord, he met Titus. And here's the news. Here's the comforting news. Titus reported to Paul, the church has an earnest desire. The church has mourned. The church has now a fervent mind to turn towards the Apostle Paul. Remember, if they accept Paul, it means they accept the gospel of Jesus Christ. They had responded well to the severe letter the Apostle Paul had written. Paul says, though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent. Well, though I did repent, for I perceived that the same epistle had made you sorry, though it were but for a season. Paul says, praise God for my severe letter. It was a letter of tears. You know, I feel bad. I had to be so fierce and severe in my letter to you, but, you know, I don't regret sending it. It was for your good. Now I rejoice. Not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed to repentance. For you were made sorry after a godly manner that you might receive damage by us in nothing. Paul says, praise God, you were made sorry. And not just the sorry that, sorry law, but the sorry that produced repentance, godly grief that responded to biblical correction. And Paul says, that is good. You see, godly grief from biblical correction is good. I think about my own children. I have two sons. Over the course of their growing up, I have had to discipline them. I have had to scold them. I have had even to enforce discipline. And I don't feel good. They don't feel good. There are times when I had to cane them when they were younger. And I cried. And they cried too. And we feel bad, but 
But we have to correct our children, don't we? That's what God expects us to do. They are entrusted to us to be appointed to the Heavenly Father. I had the privilege to do two years of uh, counseling work, and I was there twice a week in the detention barracks in the Singapore Armed Forces. I remember, remember this poignant visit I had with a young man who I think, in half of his sorrow, he had uh, been caught for taking drugs. He was in for 18 months. He said, if only my mother had scolded me when I was young. Now, of course I corrected him. I said, don't blame your mother, right? But there is truth to that, isn't there? If only someone had told me I was wrong. You know, when I discipline my children, I hope they change. There are times they have lied. At times they refuse to submit to authority. And I have to teach them that's wrong. I hope they feel bad, but not just that they feel bad, but that they will change. Because if they do, godly grief from biblical correction is good. Now then, can I speak frankly with you about our church family here at Pasir Panjang Christ Church? You know, we all want joy and peace and comfort, don't we? But as a church family, do we realize that godly grief from biblical correction is good? We live in a very Asian society where things are swept under the carpet. But sometimes it's always, okay, pastor say one, he must always be right. We live in a society where we'd rather not injure the fragile relationships we think we have. But as a church family, do we realize that godly grief from biblical correction is good? We prefer to say, don't judge. That's your view, that's your opinion. Don't come judge me. Oh, I agree. When it's an opinion, I don't think, really, our opinions are any better than anyone's opinion. I frankly don't think my opinion is better than yours, all right? When it comes beyond the realms of Scripture, you're free to disagree with me. I say that openly, and many people have, and I've grown from that. But where it concerns Scripture, where it concerns a facet of biblical truth, when someone comes to us and says, look, I don't think what you're doing or saying is glorifying to God. Look, look at the scripture. This is what it says. It's not just the pastor. It could be our parent. And sometimes, you know, children don't like their parents coming to them and telling this is wrong. It could be our husband and wife. I don't know about you, but I certainly don't like my wife coming to tell me, I think you're wrong. Could be our sibling, could be our ministry partner, could be someone in our care group or our fellowship group, and they come and they say, brother, sister, I don't think what you are doing and saying honors God. I think you're calibrating this wrongly. I think you're not applying this scriptural principle. What is our response? Really, what would be your response? to well-meaning people pointing us out, telling us about our sin. Godly grief from biblical correction is good. I need people coming to me if I've sinned against God. Josh, what you did was sinful. It doesn't correspond to biblical truth. You need to correct that. What would be my response? Godly grief from biblical correction is good. We need the community. We need our family, our church family. We need to grow with the family. We need people to tell us from Scripture, change. Godly grief from biblical correction is good because godly grief 
produces repentance that leads to salvation. Many people have the mistaken belief that grief equals repentance. You know, they feel really, really bad about doing something wrong. Therefore, they think they repented. Now, verse 9 tells us that godly grief leads to repentance. It produces repentance. There's a big difference. It's an eternal difference. There's a difference between regret and repentance. Regret feels bad, you know. I feel so bad about my sin. There's nothing wrong with that. But repentance is more than that. Repentance is not just feeling bad. Repentance is turning away. Turning away from past sins. You know, many of us are content to be regretful. Many of us are content with regret. You know, we want to feel bad for a while. We're going to cry. We're going to feel the process of healing catharsis. We're going to curse how selfish or how stupid or how sorry we are. But that's not repentance. Repentance is change. The root of repentance is change. Not just in attitude, but also in action. Not just in belief, but also in behavior. Not just in perception, but also in practice. We must turn. We must return to the correct position, to God's position as set out in His Word. The evidence of godly sorrow, the fruit of godly sorrow, is godly change. It's not just theoretical. It's practical. Remember the short tax collector, his name was Zacchaeus. When Jesus met him, and when he repented, what did he do? I mean, this short tax collector gave half of his possessions to the poor, and he says, if I cheated you, I repay you four times. Now, if I think about our modern-day corporations and people who have <clears throat> taken away money, do you think they'll do that? That short tax collector demonstrated repentance. I made a mistake, I repay you four times. Godly grief that makes you change. To live differently from how we have lived. To turn, to return to God's position. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation. Not to be repented of, not to be regretted. But the sorrow of the world worketh death. Look at the contrast between the two kinds of sorrow, the two kinds of grief. Godly sorrow, godly grief. And worldly sorrow, worldly grief. What's the difference? One kind, he says, in is going to lead to salvation which you will not regret. You won't regret it. You know, there are certain things we all regret. 25 years ago, I had a tuition student. He was in primary six preparing for his PSL. He was a really cute guy. I loved to teach him. I was teaching him math. One day, I called, I called to arrange the next session with his parents. And on the other end of the phone, I could hear his father's voice breaking. He's in hospital. Well, I went to see him. He was in ICU at SGH at that time. His head was wrapped. His body was stiff. All kinds of tubes. The father told me with tears in his eyes he had been knocked down by a car when he was crossing the road in front of his HDB flat. And that young, cute boy, he died. The father said, I regret letting him walk home by himself. He said, I had a regret too as his tuition teacher. I say, I regret that I did not tell him the gospel when I had the chance to, and now he's gone. Oh, we all have regrets. And usually the most meaningful regrets are the relationships we could have had. Father who could have had a longer relationship with a 12-year-old son, surely he could have more years with his son. Oh, I could have given him the gospel. He could have had a relationship with God. 
you and I don't want the regret of what I could have done, what I should have done when it comes to God and others where relationships truly matter. Godly grief that produces repentance is what we need because it is the answer to salvation that we will not regret. Say, Pastor, how can I tell what is this godly grief? Paul describes it in verse 11. He says, For behold, this selfsame thing that you sorrowed after a godly sword. What is it? What carefulness it wrought in you. Yea. What clearing of yourselves. Yea. What indignation. Yea. What fear. Yea. What vehement desire. Yea. What zeal. Yeah, what revenge, what eagerness to see justice done. In all things, you have approved yourself to be clear in this matter. You say, what is Paul emphasizing here with all of his yeas? You see, godly grief recognizes the utter sinfulness of our transgression. It hates it. It gradually hates it more and more with zeal. The Corinthian church had carefully considered themselves. They had carefully calibrated based on what was told to them by Paul. They realized they were wrong. They should make it right. They began to be indignant and upset about the attack on the Apostle Paul that they were very much a part of. They wanted very much with great zeal and desire to clear their names, make things right, see justice done. They were zealous about correcting their mistakes. This helps us to compare and contrast godly grief and worldly sorrow. Godly sorrow involves a careful and honest self-examination. This is opposed to a callous, justifying attitude. You know, when we experience godly sorrow, we are grieved because of our careful and honest self-examination. We realize what our sin means before God and how it has affected others. We consider the consequences of it. Worldly sorrow, on the other hand, is callous. As in, careless. I don't care. When people tell you something is wrong, some of you okay la, okay la. What you want? Whatever you want la, okay la. Your opinion only, right? Actually, I have 1,001 good reasons for what I did. Okay. It was also your fault. Okay. And there you have the blame shifting. It's everyone's fault except me. And sadly leads to telling half-truths where the truth becomes kind of shaded in the person's mind as to what I did and what you did. And leads to lying and self-deception. And we have to convince ourselves and our memories this is what happened, it's not really my fault. Do we have that? Are we characterized just by that worldly kind of callous, callous, justifying attitude? Godly sorrow has anger against sin and godly fear. There's a response that I will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. What is Jesus going to say? He's the righteous judge. The judge of all the earth will do right. A sense of humility acknowledging I'm here. Jesus is there. I mean, I am not. Better know my place. On the other hand, worldly sorrow is marked by Hama. Gana found out. You know, I, I helped several people before who got trouble in the law. We run hope counseling services, and somehow word has traveled around that people, I, people know I was a lawyer before. So they come. Many of them they come also to find out what, what they can do to get out of the consequences of what they have done. How can they minimize their, their penal correction? Now, many of them, really, they're not believers. They just regret. You know what they regret about? I was caught. <laughs> if only I'd done this, I wouldn't be caught. If only I'd done this, 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 this way, then maybe it wouldn't be illegal. <laughs> they are more interested in finding out how do I get out of the punishment? Huh? How do I improve my chance of not going to jail? They are not really concerned about what got them into trouble in the first place. There is a big difference, brothers and sisters.
Godly sorrow has a strong desire to change, an eagerness, a kangchongness, if you like, to correct themselves versus a weak desire to change and a really relaxed liberal position. You know, some people don't want to change. They are forced to change. If I don't do this, then my girlfriend won't go out with me. The desire is so weak that they just look at the consequence and are motivated by that. No consequence, no change. Some people brush off what they don't like to hear. I was one time I told someone, hey, you're quite distracted. Huh? You're not really paying attention. You're always on your phone. Huh? When we are worshiping together from the pulpit, I can see you. I can see you. I'm seeing you. I'm looking at you, okay? <laughs> Just kidding. Okay. No, but that's really what I told him. His was a really obvious case. Okay. You know what he said? He said, Pastor, don't be so strict. Lah. Take things slowly, can or not. Don't nag. Huh? You change step one, don't ask me to go to step ten. I already come to church for service. Don't expect me to pay attention. Oh, human, right? Messages come to my phone, I need to check. You know what I said? Okay, you tell that to God. You're going to tell that to God. Lah. You're worshipping God, right? No, it should be me. It's as if you were prepared to say, God, don't expect me to worship you. I come very good already, you know? It's as if, God, I do the lowest common denominator. Why not enough, ah? That's not godly sorrow. Godly grief is a fruitful and effective process which leads to action. It's not just something we are meant to wallow in. Yeah? It's, it's something to spur us to action, to change, to make right our wrongs, to be zealous for good works, to run from sin and turn and start walking in the opposite direction. But worldly grief, on the other hand, makes you idle and stagnant. You mean this one not enough? You don't change. You don't grow. You don't fight against the deeds of the flesh. Yeah, you may think about your mistakes. You may, you know, you may worry about what other people think about you. That's not enough. If you have godly grief, you will be moved to action, not just wallow in it week after week, year after week. You know, some people, they go into depression because they say, I'm so bad. I'm so bad. I feel so guilty about what I've done. That's not godly grief I mean do you just want to feel bad week after week year after year and go to depression or do you really want to change for godly sorrow works repentance to salvation that is not to be regretted but the sorrow of the world works death the sorrow of the world is going to lead to death it is built on self-pity consumed with us rather than with God I mean think about two characters that had to do with the death of Jesus Christ think about two of the disciples of Jesus Christ Judas and Peter. Judas betrayed the Lord Jesus. Peter denied the Lord Jesus. Both felt bad. I mean, Judas even wanted to return the money, right, to the, to the temple. I mean, the money he took for betraying Jesus. But it was a worldly sorrow. It was without repentance. There was only depression, and he committed suicide. He took his life. It led to death. Look at Peter. He wasn't just sorry, sorry that I denied Jesus. He chose to change. Jesus asked him in that wonderful scene of restoration in John 21, do you love me? Three times. And Peter, with all of the sorrow in his heart, he said, yes, Lord, I love you. And Jesus said, you will do something about it. Feed my sheep, feed my lambs, feed my sheep. And finally, he told Peter, you follow me. And you know what Peter did? On the day of Pentecost, he stood up and he preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. He went to Cornelius' house and he preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. He risked all of his life as a persecuted pastor in Asia Minor. He followed Jesus all the way to death. As tradition tells us, he considered it not worthy to be crucified like my Savior. Crucify me upside down. Oh, Peter changed. Because he loved the one who first loved him. And he fed his sheep. And he followed him.
without godly sorrow, without repentance. Disobedience to God will eventually become our norm. We will become immune, as it were. We'll be on our path to spiritual death. Brothers and sisters, instead, instead of obsessing just over regret and feeling bad due to the opinions of others or other people who tell us about things, godly grief mourns for sin. It turns from sin. There's a repentance of change and it finds forgiveness for sin in Jesus Christ because ultimately repentance leads to salvation. What gives repentance this power? What truly empowers this repentance in reconciliation? For he hath made him to be sin for us. Who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him, the substitutionary atonement of Jesus Christ, who became sin for us, where God dealt with the spiritual consequences of sin eternally in Christ to reconcile us to himself. When we turn from sin, where godly grief produces that repentance and there is no judgment left on us because Jesus Christ has paid the price. Repentance has the power of leading to salvation because it allows us to enter into the reconciling relationship with God through Jesus Christ, His Son, our Saviour. Where there is no repentance, there is no salvation. Listen to the famous words of Jesus when he began his public ministry, when he first stepped into the private, out of the private into the public eye. What did he say? He said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Godly grief that produces repentance. Godly grief from biblical correction is good. Godly grief produces repentance that leads to salvation. And finally, godly grief brings comfort and joy and confidence. We saw how this bookmark began with comfort and joy and confidence. Where he said, I am now bold towards you. I'm boasting of you. I'm filled with comfort. I'm filled with joy. Why? Because of the response. The godly grief that produced repentance and led them towards embracing Paul and the gospel of Jesus Christ, towards salvation. They had turned. They had returned. They returned to Paul and the true gospel of Jesus Christ. Therefore, we were comforted in your comfort. Yea, and seemingly the more joyed we were for the joy of Titus. His spirit was refreshed by you all. If I posted anything of, to him of you, I'm not ashamed. As we spake all things to you in truth, even so our boasting, which I made before Titus, is found a truth. I rejoice, therefore. I have confidence in you in all things. And that is how that section ends. A bookmark with the same comfort and joy and confidence. What we all want. We want true comfort, true joy, true confidence. We want God to rejoice in us. We want others to receive comfort and joy and be confident in us. We want the God of all comfort to comfort us, not just as it stays with us, but that with the comfort we receive, we comfort others. How does that happen? How does that happen? When we sin against God, true reconciliation can only come about when there is godly grief that produces repentance. Godly grief from biblical correction is good. Godly grief produces repentance that leads to salvation. And godly grief brings comfort, joy, and confidence. Let us pray. Oh, Father in heaven, this is your word. We are so thankful for it. Thank you for the reconciliation that you achieved in Christ where you brought us to yourself. The power of that is displayed when there is godly grief that produces repentance. Father, 
Help us to recognize that godly grief from biblical correction is good. I pray for our church family. I pray for our families that are here. And when parents, when siblings, when spouses, when church family in care groups and fellowship groups tell us that we are wrong from Scripture. How us to respond because godly grief from biblical correction is good. It produces repentance that leads to salvation, Father, save us from the worldly sorrow that we all can pretend to exhibit. Grant us the comfort and joy and confidence that godly grief which produces repentance ultimately leads to that salvation. It is Christ and all of his sanctifying work on the cross for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.